living things all have an instinct to preserve themselves, which is fine so long as they're not more powerful than us and could destroy us, right? I and mean, that's the problem. If, if we just create new entities that are weak, uh, fine, but you know, but you've got a cat as a pet, not a tiger. Yashua Bengio is a pioneer in the field of artificial neural networks and deep learning and is one of the world's most influential voices on artificial intelligence. But more and more, he's been sounding the alarm about how fast AI is progressing. Research on countermeasures to protect society from potential rogue AIs. Now he's pushing for more government control over the technology. He also wants more public supercomputers so those who regulate AI will be able to keep up with the booming private tech sector. I sat down with him at his home in Montreal, just next to Mount Royal Park, to get a sense of what's on his mind for the year ahead and why he's so determined to bring his message to those in power that unchecked, the positives of artificial intelligence are outweighed by its perils. What are the scenarios that you are worried about happening, especially these catastrophic scenarios? So I, I, I don't see extremely catastrophic scenarios within a year. Um, the earliest I could see them would be two, three years. At least that's what other people are you know, claiming that seems possible because we still need more advances in, in, in the capabilities of AI to, to get really scary. Um, so what, what can go wrong? There, there are two major categories of risks, uh, in my opinion. There is the category of misuse, um, not necessarily intended by the people who built those AI, but it, you know, it falls in the wrong hands. They use it for disinformation, but also for cyber attacks, for helping to design weapons, uh, and then there is a risk of what people call loss of control. Uh, you have to understand the reason why we have the misuse is that we, we don't know how to program AI systems so that they wouldn't be used for something bad. Uh, we, we can't, like we try to tell the AI, you know, don't, don't do cyber attacks or don't do disinformation, but it's easy to bypass these safety protections. And similarly, we don't know how to program it so that it doesn't uh, get to have a mind of its own and turns against humans. There are people, scientists, technologists, CEOs, who would be happy to see humanity replaced by superhuman AIs. They think that intelligence is more important than, you know, humanity. Or Who are you talking about? Ah, uh, no names. Uh, but it's easy to find. So what was the issue with loss of control? Well, we could basically create new types of living entities that have their own preservation as a more important value than our own uh, well-being. And, uh, and, and people who would like to see humans replaced by machines could simply give them that objective, fend for yourself, preserve yourself. And then it's like we just created a new entity that initially may just live in computers, but with robots one day, they can roam the planet. What is misalignment in this conversation? So misalignment is at the root of both problems. So the misalignment is the, the problem that we don't know how to program those AIs so that they behave as intended. We can give them instructions and in general they seem to do it and sometimes they do weird things. And it's those weird things that are worrisome. And, um, it can turn really bad potentially and there are even arguments showing that by trying to do what we're asking them they might turn against us which seems very weird and complicated let's say you you want to train a, 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 a grizzly if the grizzly is in a cage and you train it with rewards like food when it does the right thing it might learn to do the things you want right um, and that's the way we train AI, by the way. We give it rewards when it does the right thing. So, so long as we control the rewards, like the food, and the bear is in its cage, all is good. <laughs> you see where I'm going? Open the cage. Um, now, the bear doesn't care about what we really want. It's just gonna grab the food that is its reward, right? 
So it's the same. We we could have AI that take control of the rewards that we gave we give them and basically fend for themselves and and then don't need our approval. In your recent paper that you wrote, you, you argue there's a need to develop what you call defensive AI. Yes. And when confronted with that enemy that is smarter than us potentially, we need to more than just a, an off switch. We need essentially countermeasures. What is that? Okay, so we do want an off switch, but it's not going to work because somebody in some country is going to still do something. Now that we know how to build AI that may eventually be smarter than us, somebody's going to do it. So we should put off switches. We should put regulation. We should minimize the chances that rogue AIs emerge one way or another. Uh, we should minimize the chances of misuse and all these threats. But we should also be realistic. Once the recipe for building such machines is known to everyone who can read a scientific paper, it's going to happen. So I think in case we don't find a way to completely stop this, we do need to find defensive solutions. Like imagine there was a rogue AI in five years from now or 10 years from now. Are we defenseless? If we are able to build AIs that we can trust, then they can become our protectors against machines that are smarter than us and we wouldn't be able to defeat ourselves. So let me try to be more concrete. Let's say somebody builds AI systems that are really good programmers and can do cyber defense or cyber attacks because it's kind of the same, two, two sides of the same coin. Well, if they are smarter than us, they might design cyber attacks that our current human programmers don't know how to deal with. So we need other AIs protecting AIs, defensive AIs, that have at least the same capabilities as those rogue AIs and are good at the same things like uh, cyber uh, and can help defend our infrastructure against these kinds of attacks. In that sense, though, we get to the political side, which is yes. who would control something like yeah. that? Who would build something like yeah. that? Where is a defensive AI going to be stored and who will control it? Yeah. What do you think? This is, this is at least as important because it's not enough to have an AI that does what we want and maybe can protect us. We need to make sure that it's not abused. Um, and humans, if they have a chance, at least some of them, enough of them will go for greed, will go for power, will go for uh, military dominance, economic dominance. How do we avoid that? And the only kind of answer, which is not completely satisfactory, but is what we have, is governance. In other words, we need to make sure that no single individual can decide what these very powerful AIs will do. It's going to be a committee that's representative of the general will, democracy is all about that. Because AI is going to be so powerful and so important in, in coming years and decades, it needs to be uh, managed democratically so that no one, no individual, no company, no political party, no government, uh, no military organization can abuse that power for achieving their own goals. What it sounds like to some degree, though, is it's kind of like a defense department or a defense industry. And we know the way that works around the world. There are, is some sharing, but there's also a quest for supremacy. Yeah. How do you avoid that from happening in arms race, essentially, yes. in that way? Yeah, there's already an arms race that's starting with, for example, the U.S. trying to prevent China from having access to those chips that are important to build current AI systems. And of course, China is not happy. And this is just like the beginning. So, well, there will be an arms race. Well, we, the best we can do is to try to reduce the heat, just like we've done for nuclear. Uh, for example, if we have these democratic governance institutions around AI, we can also tack onto that monitoring oversight from the international community that's going to make sure that, well, you're not using the AI or developing its abilities on the military offensive side, for example. So maybe the US and China make a deal. Okay, we're going to watch each other's back. And how to do that is not trivial, but conceivable. 
arms treaties, essentially. Exactly. Um, so that we know that we're not going to be attacking each other with that new kind of weapon. That's the best I can see. And it, it, it's fraught with complexities. We've seen how difficult it was and it continues to be for nuclear, but that's the only option I can see right now. What about moving to another part of this equation, which is computing power? So the fact that the technology needs massive computing resources that in order to do these very things that you're saying, um, who has access to that right now? So right now it takes a lot of capital, um, maybe 10 million to a billion, depending on how big the system, like the most expensive one right now, like Google's Gemini probably is in the billion range, the cost of building it. And so very few companies can afford or want to, you know, do that investment. You also need expertise to do that right. What about though the idea of this being private? I mean, what about building public supercomputers? Yeah. What do you, is, is that something that you think should happen? Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there are reasons for it. So it, it was kind of natural that up to now, it was mostly, um, you know, capitalism uh, doing, I mean, th th there are different phases. First, it was just academics doing it on the small scale and doing all the theory, if you want, the, the methods. And then industry took over um, to build the really large scale things that are impressive in their performance. But then I think there's a third stage, which is where governments and uh, the public in general understand that this is extremely powerful and this gives a lot of power to whoever controls that. And then governments will want to take back control. So it's going to be regulation first, but eventually they will want to take back some control, maybe initially by building their own infrastructure and that's already happening. The governments need to build that capability. They, they need to have people working for the governments that understand what can go wrong, uh, how the technology works. That's necessary even for just the regulator. Like how can regulators say, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable if they don't have the expertise and if they can't do themselves the kind of experiments that are happening right now only in companies. So that's, that's where I think it's going eventually if we want the kind of governance that I was talking about, well, it becomes like controlled by the state or maybe through some multilateral organization and less driven only by profit maximization. So I think there is likely that over the next decade, we're going to see a shift where because these things are so powerful, you need more democratic oversight. Eventually it becomes democratic control, but maybe different countries will choose different things. But have you spoken, you have a position of power, have you, or at least a voice, uh, have you spoken to, say, the Canadian yeah, government? Yeah, I would say a voice, not so much power. Of course, a powerful voice, let's That's put it that right. way. Have you spoken to the Canadian government and say, you know, or the Quebec government and said, we need to have a supercomputer, a public supercomputer here in Canada? Yes. <laughs> Did you get a response? We were listening. <laughs> It's a lot of money. Um, How much are we talking about? Well, uh, we're talking about um, like a billion dollar sort of, you know, amounts. That's uh, the UK government put down 900 million pounds for their national AI infrastructure. So, you know, the. <laughs> But, Would you like to see that in Montreal? Well, well, I think government need, will understand at some point, hopefully as soon as possible, that it's important for governments to have that muscle, to have that capability, so that they can do the things that companies might not do. So like this research on safety and alignment, yeah, companies are going to do it, but they're going to be worried about customer satisfaction, not about the end of the world so much. Um, or about threats to democracy, or about human rights issues. So there are those who criticize the approach taken by you and others, essentially overselling the dangers of, the existential dangers of AI, saying that it, 
you know, it, it, it downplays or it's to the detriment of problems that AI is already causing, causing problems in terms of discrimination, in terms of environmental impact and sort of the headlines that come from existential threats are obscuring some of these more real pressing things that AI is doing right now. I'm wondering, people who call this as, you know, AI hype, essentially. Well, I, I wish the consider that the well-being of humans around the world and our democracies are important, not just now, but in five years from now and 10 years from now. And for me, there's no separation. We need to manage the risks and minimize the harms. Now, tomorrow, in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years. Um, what is important though, and, and, we, and we don't need to make choices. And by the way, a lot of the solutions are the same. We need regulation. We need governments to get you know, invested to make sure we develop uh, solutions to, to, to minimize these threats to you know, human rights, discrimination, and so on, um, and, and you know, some of the issues I, I talked about. And in fact, a lot of the scientific solutions are about the same. They're about making sure the AIs behave morally. Um, so um, I, I, think, I think that the, the division between these two camps is, is reducing as people understand that we're fighting the same battle, essentially. Um, the division that I see now emerging as a stronger division is between uh, those who would like us to see accelerate the development of AI, who care more about let's get all the profit that we get, uh, the economic growth that we, we, we could from, from AI, which we should, but not at the detriment of destabilizing our societies, of uh, taking risks with the future of humanity, of uh, you know, endangering our democracies. We have a tradition here and a lot of expertise in Quebec, uh, both on the AI science and on the social sciences, political science, um, legal scholars who care about the impact of AI in society, who have been working on the, for example, the bias and discrimination, and are now worried about the other social risks that, that are happening. Uh, of course, we're working with people from all around the world, but that's uh, something where we have a lot of experience and, and voice and we, we, can, we can really lead, but, but uh, do it with our partners from around the world and around Canada. Thank you very much, Professor Bengio. We'll see what the year ahead does in fact bring. Yes, we'll see.